Okay, so we're back and we're going to finish up our quick discussion about genetic engineering, cloning, and such things, uh, material covered in chapters 20 and 22. So as a reminder where we are, you know, what I want you to keep in mind, of course, is sort of the big picture, right? And so when talking about cloning, obviously the point is, is to make copies of DNA, but the cloning procedure itself exemplifies exploitation of some very basic fundamental concepts in molecular biology, and those are two, right? So the, the first one has to do with base pair complementary rules, and the second one has to do with the uh, uh, various proteins that recognize specific DNA elements. So if you're thinking about the cloning procedure using restriction enzymes, well then the restriction enzyme exemplifies uh, concept number two. It the restriction enzyme, it's a protein, it recognizes particular DNA sequences. Right? So the other uh, concept, the complementary base pair rules, is also exemplified in cloning. Uh, restriction enzymes cut DNA in certain ways so that you have sort of sticky ends. So complementary base pair rules apply. The donor DNA, the vector DNA are cut with the same restriction enzymes, and so you end up having complementary base pair opportunities. Okay. In addition, when you're you're doing cloning, you you may be searching through uh, the entire genome to find the particular sequences that you want. So close close cloning uh, uh, or probes are used to identify specific sequences, and so therefore exemplifying base pair rules. Concept number one again. All right. So getting back to cloning. So why clone? Well, cloning is the first and, and most generic way to make copies of DNA. So the first being in the sense that uh, the methods were first developed in the 1970s and of course have been greatly enhanced um, ever since then, but it still remains uh, an important toolkit for making copies of DNA. And in particular where it's advantageous is if you need to make copies of DNA segments that are large too large for PCR technology to use. PCR is limited to a few thousand base pairs at, at most, um, whereas cloning you can do hundreds of thousands to even millions of base pairs length fragments. Right? So just like PCR, cloning is used to make many, many copies of the target sequence. Okay, and the reason that you need many, many copies is, of course, it's just basic experimentation, right? You need in large numbers of samples to work on things in order to improve or, or to estimate the accuracy of the sequencing method. You need to be able to sequence the same fragment over and over again so that you can get an estimate of the error in the base call rate where you're assigning the A's, T's, G's, and C's to the particular positions in the sequence. So the more copies you have, the more you can estimate that error of the base call rate. Okay, so uh, we'll talk just a little bit about some sequencing project ideas, but uh, so um, the other, of course, point about cloning is is that you think about cloning from you know the everyday news and whatnot as making copies of organisms, right? And so, of course, we've been cloning bacteria forever, but beginning in the 1990s. Um, the cloning that, that science fiction had been thinking about has been made possible. So um, to date, uh, 22 different species have been cloned using adult cells, remove the nucleus, and inserting that somehow into an, an egg, and then activating that egg, and then you then have development from an adult nucleus from a different cell inside the egg and giving rise to a perfectly good organism. So um, we'll talk just a little bit about the methods involved. They're, they're, they're not as, as efficient as we would like and whatnot, but the first was cloning of a sheep back in 1996-97. Um, her name was Dolly, and so this is Dolly here with her newborn lamb, Bonnie, 
and kind of interestingly enough, as you would predict, so Dolly was uh, created, if you will, by uh, taking a, a, a cell from an adult sheep, and Dolly's telomere links corresponded to the, the, if you will, the age of the donor, and, and that was kind of an interesting thing, right? And so people were pretty excited about Dolly, of course, and were predicting that she would have a short life, and in fact she did. She died young, she had uh, developed some cancers, I believe it was, and she also developed arthritis, and so it was sort of like, ah, see, you know, this, this isn't going to work very well. But quietly, there were other embryos that were made at the same time, and, and Dolly's sisters ended up having basically normal lifespans. So, so much for the, uh, the, the telomere link predicting uh, uh, animal lifespan. Uh, then another one, a more uh, famous, if you will, uh, animal, at least to Hawaii, is this guy here. Um, he's now in the Smithsonian. Um, so this is the actual mouse. He was cloned, or, or she was cloned, in 1998 at uh, the uh, UH Medical School, right, using techniques that were were new and innovative at the time and she went on had kids of her own and lived a long lifespan for a mouse and here just this last year she was sent to the smithsonian institution so this her name was cumulina named after the cumulus cells which are uh, cells that are nurse the the egg cell and whatnot so this was part of the somatic cell nuclear transfer methods that they researchers at the medical school came up with. Okay, so why clone? Well, one is to make copies of animals, right? All right, so I mentioned sequencing, and so we'll talk about sequencing a uh, uh, fair amount next semester, right? And so I wanted to just sort of give you an idea about we need the donor sequences, right? So and we're going to clone those, and so sequencing libraries involve making hundreds of thousands of clones and the two different approaches to the sequencing of the human genome could be summarized as basically the so-called hierarchical approach which is that you clone only fragments for which you already have good mapping information about markers, uh, landmarks, uh, STS, that's a sequence tag site. ETS, that's a, an expressed tag site. Okay. In, in other words, you have known DNA elements, and so you sort of operize, operate your, uh, your uh, fragment libraries. You get about 150,000 base pair length fragments. And the idea is using your landmarks and your markers is sort of you just march those fragments from one end of the chromosome to the other so that you don't have to have millions of copies. You have sort of a minimum desired number of fragments, each one providing unique information as you march along the chromosome, right? And so this technique, hierarchical approach is sort of map first, sequence later. Another approach uh, was basically uh, sort of, I can't wait for this, and so instead of generating these large fragments with known DNA uh, marker sites and landmarks, locations of genes, etc., let's just blow the whole thing up, collect every fragment we possibly can, and put those into bacteria. So this approach, the hierarchical approach, was, was the uh, approach that sort of government agencies, universities, and whatnot uh, took with the idea that we're going to spend 20 years mapping everything, and then we will generate our, our bacterial libraries, whereas the whole genome shotgun approach was the private consortium, uh, um, his, his name is Craig Ventner, uh, and used it say, look, let's just blow it all up, grab all the fragments, whether they're from the same area or not, we'll sequence everything. So in other words, sequence first, map last. Okay? So th those are the two sort of, you know, bookends of the idea of what a genomic library would entail. You either know pretty much everything about the fragments, or you know nothing about the fragments. But either one of them can be sources for putting them into a vector. Okay? 
And then the other general class of libraries that you might be uh, familiar with was the idea is like, look, we have a project. We're looking at, we're trying to figure out the difference between normal cells and cancer cells. So what we need to know is what genes have expressed in normal cells versus cancer cells. So we don't need all of the sequence. We just need the sequences of the protein coding regions so that we can sequence those and compare normal cells versus cancer cells. So this is called a cDNA library. Basically what you do is you get total RNA, okay, and then you collect just those sequences, the mRNA sequences that are from genes, right? So you pull out RNAs based on the poly A tail and you collect all of those for the normal cells, all of those for the cancer cells, and you have now two libraries based on the messenger RNAs that were present in the cells. It's a cDNA library because the technique begins with RNA, but what you do to work with it is you take the RNA and you make it into DNA. So we'll remind you about how to do that in a couple of slides. Okay. So essentials, just this is just a sort of a go through the, the protocols, the basic ideas, the protocols. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you're getting a sense that these are large projects. Okay. This isn't the kind of research that one person and a couple of technicians or grad students is going to do all by themselves. Uh, so opportunity for um, major innovation in sequencing technologies, figuring out how to get lots of samples without having to do the massive amount of library building. Okay, So we'll talk about how to make a cDNA. Basically cDNA stands for complementary DNA and it's made from an, a messenger RNA template. So the protocol idea would be you isolate the messenger RNA from the tissues and cells. So you know you extract total RNA, and then you pull messenger RNA out of there by using uh, primers that will, of course, anneal with the poly A tail that's specific to the messenger RNA. Then after you've amplified those sequences, you then add reverse transcriptase, and of course your your A's, T's, G's, and C's, and you make single strand DNA using reverse transcriptase. Right? And you add your DNA polymerase 3, right? And now that you have a single strand DNA, you make double stranded DNA. And then you have basically a cDNA fragment that you can then clone. All right, so quick exam question. True or false? The primary structure, so the sequence, right, of the cDNA corresponds to the primary structure of the gene. Wait. Fifty-fifty. What's your shot? What's your call? Okay. If we're talking about a eukaryotic gene, of course, cDNA is going to lack the introns. It'll also, of course, lack the promoter enhancer elements, the regulatory sequences. So the cDNA represents the end result of any processing of the RNA transcription. Okay. So it would be false for eukaryote genes. In what sense would it be true? And if you said for prokaryote genes, thumbs up. Okay. So let's talk briefly about designer organisms. So another way of talking about genetic, genetic engineering, recombinant DNA, it's more commonly known as genetically modified organisms. So I'll have you do a little lookup, a little uh, activity. Look up Belgian blue and tell me what, whether or not this is a genetically modified organism. Uh, by the way, cows don't normally look like this. <laughs> okay, got that? Exam question. All right, maybe it's a bonus. All right, all right. So we've shifted now from talking about cloning into we're going to skip right over methods to do genetic modification in organisms 101, and to sort of get into the ethics part. So 
in one sense, DNA is just DNA, right? So transgenic organisms are just another means by which we manipulate nature. So what I'm suggesting is that some of the pushback about GMOs has really nothing to do with the procedures themselves. It's, a, it's an unsettled feeling that we have that, yet again, we're pushing nature too much. We're, we're skipping ahead in the line. We're doing things that we're not meant to do. All right? So I don't know how to argue about that. So um, one way to think about this is that making transgenic organisms is just a logical extension of what we've been doing for thousands and thousands of years with animals and plants that we've domesticated. So in the transgenic organism case, we certainly specifically select genes from one organism and, or introduce them into another to, to uh, provide a desired trait that wasn't present before. Okay? And so the genetic technology allows us to do this in a way that's more efficient and more directed than before, but it's not like this wasn't part of agriculture or the domestication process before. So in particular, people with working with plants have been aware of mixing genomes since the very beginning of agriculture. But you take one plant and you take a different plant and you see if you can put them together through hybridization, right? So that's been done for thousands of years, right? Um, another way to put it is if you have this kind of idea that we're manipulating nature, you should appreciate that nature has been mixing genomes since the beginning of time. So we can distinguish the source of DNA as that it's either through vertical gene transfer, which is a fancy way of saying parents, offspring, offspring become parents, offspring, so that, that the transmission of genetic information is from parents to offspring and so on and so forth. So that's the vertical part. The, the, another way to do it, of course, is from one species to another species. So that's called horizontal gene transfer. And again, that sounds a little weird for us, but you should appreciate that bacteria have been doing this for a billion years. And in fact, bacteria often acquire antibiotic resistance through this mechanism. So the one species of bacteria will be have a resistance gene against a particular antibiotic. The, the, the gene is often in a plasmid and so bacteria, totally different species, subjected to the antibiotic treatment, if it's adjacent to a resistant strain, the the two bacteria can exchange genetic material, all right? Whether or not this happens in us is sort of up to debate, but when you start looking at sequences and you identify sequences by homology, sequence similarity to other organisms, instead of the gen vertical gene transfer, so from our, ans our primate ancestors, from our mammal ancestors, we have many sequences that look like they have come by a different route from viruses, for example, right? So it's a little bit up to debate, but the point is, is that nature has a way of mixing genomes. We're using a particular method, um, but it's it's a natural method in that sense. All right. So okay. So what's the concern? So some of the the, the the concerns can be well, you're not just putting in a gene. You're also in order to get expression of that gene, you have to add other sequences. And if those sequences sort of don't go where you think you you want them to go, you can end up turning on other processes that you don't want to. So anyway, the basic idea of putting a foreign gene into, into a, a host is that you, you put together what's called an expression cassette. So you include regulatory sequences and you link those to those genes, one, two, three, or as many as you want. Okay, And then you also add in a terminator, which includes a poly A tail, all right? And so this is sort of like we're putting in a, an operon, right? Okay. 
So the point is, is that you're, you're putting in a package that has a self-contained regulatory sequence. And so when you put it into a genome, how do you know that it goes where you want it to? How do you know that it doesn't disrupt endogenous genes? And the answer is, uh, we're working on it. Okay, so in other words, this can happen. And we'll talk about uh, instances where in gene therapy, this has in fact happened. It's not true that, that every area of the genome is equally welcoming to new DNA sequences. Some are more likely to take up new gene sequences than others. And then the other point is that even if you get the, the sequence located into the area in the genome that you want, when you go from one cell to two cells to four cells through my, how do you know that recombination isn't going to uh, swap out that perfectly aligned sequence that you have into something else, okay? And then finally, you know, when we're talking about agriculture uses, how do you know that that expression cassette you put in will remain in the host genome forever as opposed to being uh, uh, transferred out via horizontal gene transfer? So these are some of the th concerns people have. And so what I would suggest is that these are what-if stories. What if, what if, what if. And so part of it is, of course, it always requires more research. All right. So... Some of the criticisms you'll hear is things like this. Wow, the science hasn't been done. Uh, there's no credible evidence that GMO foods are safe to eat, and on and on and on. But these claims are false. Okay, To say that the research hasn't been done is false. All right. So there's just one example from a few years back. This was uh, reviews more than 2,000 articles from primary sources about experimental tests on what? genetically modified organisms, right? So to say that the research hasn't been done is not true, all right? Has it been done in every possible way that can extinguish all criticism? The answer is, of course, no. Okay. The other part, you know, it's like we have this one thing we teach you to, you know, to, to question authority. Don't just take, because somebody's in charge, don't, don't, just say, okay, you know, but, but I would say, though, that these are, are certainly credible uh, scientific bodies and regulatory agencies, and across the world, they've all come in and said, genetically modified organisms, it's a safe technology. Okay, so I did want to point out that it's safe, but I'm uncomfortable sometimes about how it is um, practiced in the following way. So Hawaii is in the middle of the Pacific. Maybe you're aware of it, maybe you're not, but an awful lot of genetically modified experiments are being done in Hawaii. <laughs> so why are they doing that? And it's like, well, partly it's the idea then that if something bad happens, it happens in the middle of the Pacific. So we have a long history, how shall we say, of the U.S. doing things to Pacific Islands. And so from a historical point of view, I'm not particularly comfortable about this, this kind of thing. And I would also remind you that when you fly to Hawaii, they don't inspect you about whether or not you're traveling with plants and organisms, right? They ask you and have you fill out a form before you but they don't inspect you and they don't. But if you're going the other way, right? Ag inspection happens before you can board on the plane. And the reason is in part because of this GMO technology, these experimental plots, mostly on Kauai. So at any rate, um, there's an enormous agricultural interest in Hawaii about GMOs run by corporations that are, you know, outside of Hawaii. So there is something to at least question about this. Um, technology seems fine. Okay, so why would you want to do this? Well, again, this is basically you can introduce new varieties of plants or animals far more quickly than using traditional methods of trying to hybridize. Okay, um, main use is in agriculture, and so the pros and cons of this is uh, one of the areas is to develop uh, uh, 
herbicide resistance so you can grow corn and then you can go after uh, weeds that are also growing because they're not if you will resistant to the pesticide or the insecticides that you use and then the other of course is to introduce pest resistant genes um, and so these are two common GMO approaches in agriculture and these so this is uh, you know one of the the agents that's used the insecticide this is a, a pest that we're trying to get rid of the corn borer uh, moth infects thousands of corn, hundreds of species of plants, costs hundreds of millions of dollars and lost. Okay, so that's the, the, the incentive for doing GMO. Okay. But again, um, this is an old graph. I gotta update this. But what I'm trying to get at is that this is a USA dominated opinion. Okay, the, most of the world is not really on the side of this, and so uh, I'm not a big fan of pie charts, but what it's trying to suggest is that you know, the acreage that's used um, and grows GMO crops throughout the world, almost two-thirds of it is found in the United States. Okay, um, all right. Okay, so let's switch gears here and talk about us. So I've mentioned, without really spending any great deal of time on it, that there's literally thousands of conditions in us that have a single gene is responsible in large part. And so um, we don't have <laughs> any ways to cure these things if it's part of your DNA, unless we can get in and replace that DNA, right? Um, this is opposed to the idea of using what's called antisense therapy, where you design a, a complementary sequence that would then interfere with the messenger RNA and block it so it's not translated. What we're talking about in gene therapy is the idea of replacing a defective mutant allele with a functional one. Okay, and this has been going on for you know decades at this point, and there have been. Uh, some examples of tremendous success. And so uh, if you look in your book, there's one of those successes. Uh, she had uh, was born with uh, an immune disorder, you know, an autoimmune disorder, and they were able to give her basically a, a, a functioning immune system, at least part of it, okay, through replacing a defective gene with an active one. Okay, so this is clearly the promise, and to all intents and purposes, she herself was cured. She was administered the, the therapy, if you will, once she was a four-year-old. All right, so that's the promise of it, right? But it's been failure after failure in the following sense. Remember, our problem was how do you get that expression cassette to go into the genome exactly where you want. And so the uh, uh, one common strategy is to use what's called an adenovirus, goes into your lungs, gets into your genome, fantastic, except for you can't make it go exactly where you want. And so one of the things is that we were sort of assuming that it would be a random chance where these uh, uh, expression cassettes would end up locating in the genome. You know, 3.3 billion base pairs. If you think about each base pair having a one divided by n chance, but that's going to be the insertion site. You know, I like my chances. There's only a few really important sites where you just absolutely don't want this to insert. But, but at any rate, as you can see from the title here, one of the, the common side effects of gene therapy is that an overwhelming number of the children who've had the treatment will end up having aggressive leukemias, All right? So this, this violates, you know, a very basic precept of, of doing medicine, right? The first area is to not do more harm. So if you end up giving the kids leukemia and they die of the leukemia, um, you know, not such a hot therapy, right? Okay, so what I, I would suggest though is that if you start looking about this, there are, you know, a number of 
projects that are still worked on from the idea of gene therapy, trying to fix genetic-based diseases. And this ranges from eye disease to cystic fibrosis, muscle-wasting disease on the X chromosome, uh, Parkinson's disease, coronary artery, and Huntington's, and on and on and on. All right? Okay. Pretty much anything you can think about, people are thinking about gene therapy as an approach. So let's talk again from an ethical point of view. We can distinguish two kinds of uh, gene therapy. There's the gene therapy in which you're working with a child or an adult, but the therapy ends with the lifetime of that individual. So that's going to be somatic gene therapy. The other kind of approach would be if we work on the germline, if we fix the sperm or the egg in which the genome carries the mutations that, that will wind up ending in disorders, we'll fix it there. That's called germline gene therapy. And I think you can appreciate pretty quickly that the ethics around somatic, as in adult gene therapy, versus germline gene therapy, uh, the ethics are different. Somatic issues end with the lifespan of the individual. Potentially, germline gene therapy is open-ended. It potentially extends beyond the life of the patient. Okay, And it would also likely involve ex invasive experimentation on human embryos. And so I think you can, we can distinguish between the two. The ethical situations are quite different. Okay, so I'm going to skip through this. This is about what's called therapeutic cloning, okay? And this is related to, remember, we talked about cloning, okay? So the idea then would be we're going to try to fix the embryo using the technology to clone, right? So therapeutic cloning, reproductive cloning, embryonic stem cells, all of those things sort of pop up into this idea. How did we make Dolly? Took it from an uh, adult, got the nucleus, put it into an egg, right? So this would be akin to germline therapy, right? Okay. All right, so we're going to end with the question. True or false? Plus explain. So between now and the exam, I would expect you to be able to answer true or false to this question but also to defend your answer. So yes, this is an internet question. Search on it. Beware the cranks, right? But I also want you to think about mechanism, right? Messenger RNA is an example of gene therapy. So what I need from you is a clear definition of what gene therapy is. And how is a messenger RNA related to gene therapy? Okay, so that's the end of this slide.